any time any of us are working on anything. I think it's very difficult to predict what the outcome of that work product will be. Um, sometimes uh, a project gets lucky. In the case of Night of the Living Dead, I think the project and we got very lucky. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Usually, Night of the Living Dead is talked of in um, regards to its to re relation to previous zombie movies, though it doesn't actually use the word zombie. I mean, one of the problems with pre-Night of the Living Dead zombie films is what to do with zombies. Um, and so you get movies like White Zombie or I Walked with a Zombie or Plague of the Zombies, which are all about the, the evil people who exploit zombies rather than zombies themselves who are walking furniture. Now when people say zombies, it means something different. I didn't see uh, one of the most famous zombie films, I Walked with a Zombie, until relatively recently. Um, uh, that, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say, doesn't stand up awfully well today um, because the lead zombie is little more than a catatonic woman, uh, completely harmless. She doesn't eat anyone. Romero changed the rules and uh, it was uh, Night of the Living Dead was a very, very important film. There's no doubt about it. I think it makes as much sense to relate Night of the Living Dead to um, Invisible Invaders or The Last Man on Earth, which is a, an Italian film based on an American novel, I Am Legend, as it does to relate it to White Zombie or King of the Zombies or even Plague of the Zombies. Those are kind of a different thing. I mean, uh, the notion of the zombie apocalypse, the you know, flesh-eating ghouls, the idea of an infection, all of those come from other stories. They're, they're sort of from vampire stories. That's what Richard Matheson in I Am Legend does with it. And if you look at most uh, zombie apocalypse movies, zombies are like the weather. They could be an earthquake um, or a hurricane or a volcano for all the difference that would make to the plot. And that distinguishes them from most monsters who have some kind of human, moral, relatable dimension. Maybe it's what makes zombies the, the nightmare creature for our time. Okay, a, uh, an admittedly hokey premise, recently dead people coming back to life. However, if such a th phenomenon could happen, how would it play out uh, in, and affect the lives of the people around them? And that we tried to depict as we thought people might react. And that strategy and that storytelling, certainly in the case of Night of the Living Dead, did pay off. Romero's Night of the Living Dead was uh, a superlative horror film and uh, I can still remember distinctly seeing it in a cinema in London's Piccadilly in 1970. I remember that it seemed so real that just for a moment when I came out of the cinema I expected to see zombies walking down Piccadilly. And then, of course, I clicked back into reality, and I felt that that was the mark of a, a truly great horror film. Johnny! Well, you're still afraid. Stop it now, I mean it. It was our first attempt at a narrative feature film, and we wanted that to be uh, portrayed in a way that was as realistic as possible. Night of the living dead, the dead who live on living flesh. Associated theaters were the first theaters that played Night of the Living Dead. And uh, George Stern, who was one of two cousins who operated Associated Theaters, the night after it opened in their theaters, called and he said, uh, you boys are going to make a million dollars with this picture because uh, we have never seen 
a first night turnout for what actually was a drive-in movie, uh, a neighborhood theater movie. And in his experience, he knew right from the very beginning uh, that there was something special about this film. So much so that he picked up the phone and he called his exhibition counterparts in Philadelphia and Cleveland and Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, and other places and said to his uh, exhibition uh, compatriots, you have to book this picture. We are doing our opening night business was phenomenal. Uh, and ultimately, uh, th that connection from the uh, man who was responsible for the Pittsburgh exhibition spread through the movie business like wildfire. So it did pretty much right from the jump, uh, get launched into something more than just, oh, it's just another drive-in movie. It was everything from uh, that we got was from hero worship to people thought that we were satanically inspired and that we should, we, we had this, uh, made a movie of absolutely no social redeeming value and that uh, we, we had no place as movie artists, as film artists, and everything in between. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. I personally did not pay as much attention to uh, other films that came in the, in the close footprint of Night of the Living Dead, but I did know uh, that Night of the Living Dead, although we certainly could not have uh, planned for or predicted it to be so groundbreaking, it was. <laughs> Night of the Living Dead essentially creates its own genre. Zombie movies started to hit home and, and in between Night of the Living Dead and before we got to like Romero's opus of Dawn of the Dead, you had um, the Spanish produced movie, Living Dead at Manchester Morgue, there was the Amanda de Sorio's Blind Dead. I think they did four or five of those. A beautiful young girl is trapped by the evil forces. No one is safe from their curse. They touch base with what Romero did. They use bits and pieces of the other film. And because they're in a different context, and because some of them are made by sort of interesting filmmakers, they have stuff going on in them. Imagine, if you will, that something has gone terribly wrong. Man. Now, except the fact that there's no escaping the horrible consequences, George Romero brings back the dead. Night of the Living Dead has ended. Dawn of the Dead is here. Night, Night of the Living Dead I saw when I was, I think, about 13, 14, closely followed by Dawn, which is one of my favourite zombie movies. Uh, and I kind of, I just thought those were the, the benchmark of zombie films. We have spawned our own savagery. Soon it will consume us all. Cioè, quando io ho visto Zombie, l'ho visto insieme a Dario Argento, che lo stava montando, perché Dario ha rimontato il film di Romero, ha tolto 40 minuti da quella che era l'edizione, diciamo, originale del film di Romero, e ha cambiato le musiche. When there is no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. My favorite uh, version of Dawn of the Dead is Dario Argento's cut because uh, he made it a little bit shorter and he turned up the rock music. And so I don't know if that's an Italian influence like, on an American movie, but for me that was the perfect sort of zombie movie ever. It is a horrible, hauntingly accurate vision of the mindless excesses of a society gone mad. Per cui tra la versione americana, quella girata da Romero e quella italiana c'è una grossa differenza perché la ragazza che è incinta nel film di Romero si vedono tutti e nove i mesi della gravidanza mentre qui si vede i due che si sposano, l'accenno di gravidanza poi siamo già alla fine cioè la parte in mezzo che è la parte diciamo 
di stabilizzazione, cioè loro vivono dentro il supermercato blindati e gli zombie sono fuori, quindi per un periodo di tempo apparentemente non succede niente, i vivi continuano a vivere all'interno del consumismo finché riescono a consumare, i morti sono fuori e vogliono entrare per poter consumare, poi a un certo punto l'equilibrio si rompe e i morti venti entrano dentro. Ma mentre il film di Romero ha una valenza sociologica molto alta, e quindi andava da una, e, e poi era un discorso più di horror di massa, non so come dire, di sensazione. Dawn of the dead. Meet me on the roof at 9 o'clock. Get yeah. out. I don't believe We're it. We're going to get out in the chopper. We've got to survive. Somebody's got to survive. With the success uh, of Dawn of the Dead uh, worldwide, then the Italians did their, their usual thing of slipping in into the genre and doing their own sort of imitations and... You know, and it brings us around to Fulci's zombie flesh eaters or zombie as it's known in the US. I'm so scared we're not going to make it off this island. <laughs> zombie 2, Zombie 2 naturalmente era una rip off, lo chiamano gli americani, su Zombie, il film di Giorgio Romero che era stato fatto da Dario. You know, whatever it is. E il film di Fulci è uscito prima di quello di Romero e soprattutto era stato scritto un anno e mezzo prima. Il film Zombie 2 nasce in un altro modo, nasce nel 1978, più o meno d'estate, giugno-luglio, perché un produttore che si, chiama, si chiamava, è morto adesso, Gianfranco Culiungian, mi ha chiesto, mi ha fatto leggere un fumetto italiano, che era Tex Wheeler, dove c'era un'avventura di Tex nella Valle della Morte, dove incontrava una sorta di morti viventi. Allora mi, mi ha chiesto se era possibile fare un film, una commistione tra horror e western. Allora io ho detto che no. Questo non era possibile, ma che sarebbe stato possibile fare invece una commissione tra avventura e, e horror. Il film viene girato con il titolo originale che è L'Isola dei Morti Viventi. A giugno, quando il film è finito, si ha notizia che Dario Argento sta girando Zombie con Romero. Allora Ugo Tucci fa una drittata, cambia il titolo per sfruttare la notorietà di Dario e del film di Romero. Perché non accettavano l'idea che altri facessero il seguito di un film loro e hanno fatto causa, cioè hanno fatto causa al Tribunale di Roma chiedendo il cambiamento del titolo perché dice zombie è nostro, loro non possono fare il seguito del nostro film. E però il Tribunale ha respinto la loro richiesta dicendo che zombie non era un titolo inventato da loro, ma era una parola di uso comune e quindi ha respinto la richiesta e loro non hanno potuto fare niente e il film ha continuato a circolare con quel titolo. In Italy, Dawn of the Dead was released as Zombie and Fulci's came out as uh, Zombie Due. And, but if you, if you get past the title, there's really no comparison because Fulci's in the Caribbean dealing with voodoo and Romero's Dawn of the Dead is the continuation of Night of the Living Dead. I mean, what the hell's going on here? Have you ever heard of voodoo? Voodoo? Doctor, you gotta be joking. That's kid stuff. I mean, voodoo is just plain superstitious horseshit. Sì, c'è l'idea degli zombie, ma forse va più sugli zombie... Sì, ruba qualcosa a Romero, lo zombie cannibale, che prima non era cannibale. Però per il resto si rifà al vecchio cinema degli zombie, lo white zombie di Bela Lugosi, The Plague of the Zombies, The Hammer Film, questo tipo di cinema con la violenza moderna, col sangue moderno e con alcune grandi idee di, di Fulci. So that stirs back in something from a form of the zombie movie that pre-exists Night of the Living Dead, but it doesn't actually do much with it. It's, it's a, a zombie outbreak picture. Quindi eh, non si può dire che è un seguito, non è un seguito, casomai è un prequel, cioè quello che succede prima degli avvenimenti narrati nello zombie di Romero. 
perché Fulci decide di ambientare la sua storia nella terra del voodoo e della magia nera, nei Caraibi. Il mio film, che era un avventuroso, era girato come un giallo e quindi io ho scritto questa storia ambientata nei Caraibi, dove in realtà poi mi rifacevo un pochino all'isola Dottor Moreau, ad altre cose, perché poi in realtà c'è una c'era un medico un più o meno pazzo che faceva degli esperimenti, così questo genere, e quindi ha leggende caraibiche. Voodooism, zombies. Been rife for centuries. I think the main similarity between the two films is the big sort of siege ending. Um, and that's, that's kind of a common thing in zombie movies. I mean, you have to find somewhere to kind of hold up. You have to, you have to figure out a strategy, and, and the best strategy seems to be find somewhere you can defend, block yourself in. Although it is kind of the worst strategy, because as soon as you do that, they just keep coming, and they know you're in there, they know there's food in there, and they just kind of mill around aimlessly, and they're never going to go away. What both films are suggesting is that you know, there is no stopping the zombie apocalypse. There is no way to end it. Both films are saying, we can't stop this, we can't fight it. That, that is, that it is the true apocalypse. There is no happy ending to either of these stories. In realtà, l'unica scena che è molto legata al film di Romero è proprio il finale, cioè gli zombie sul ponte di Brooklyn perché in quel momento lì tu vedi la massa di zombie che cammina verso una città che in quel momento lì rappresentava il massimo del consumismo e di queste cose qui e quindi si riaggancia ovviamente alla tematica di Romero. George Romero's Dawn of the Dead was a kind of an allegory about, you know, like the, the shopping generation and, and I think the Italians kind of dropped all those metaphors and, and went back to more like classic ghost stories and it was all about the mood and the atmosphere and, and the pacing and the music and it was very much more like, almost like a gothic horror sort of the, the classic horror with you know uh, uh, with you know smoke and fog and, and much more stylized I suppose. What was lost in perhaps more sophisticated narrative is found stylistically. He's very deliberate in where he places the camera, very deliberate on what you see. The long lingering shots of somebody getting their eye poked out. Love, you know, he loves watching the eyes getting poked out. Those are very, you know, he really pays attention. It's, it's very much about his style. I mean, that lingering shot of the boat coming into New York Harbor is amazing. I mean, in New York is often used in horror films. But actually, people really forget that New York is on the open ocean. The harbor is there, but this is the first time that it took an Italian to come in and say, no, New York, you are connected to the ocean where some evil can come up a long way. And he takes his time with that shot. He understands the space that these people are inhabiting much better than Romero does. But then Romero's got the advantage of a, a really strong story. Stay where you are, mister. Throw your hands on the deck there. I told you not to move. Romero's is more of a solid story piece with effects pieces, whereas Fulci's movie is after you get to the island, sort of halfway through, it's, it's, it's the abattoirness of the effects and it's the, you know, the crunchiness of those special effects. The look of the zombies is, is interesting in the different, the different types of films. Um, I mean, the Romero ones, they have this kind of just generic blue or green paint and then the closer ones, they've got the more the elaborate stuff. Um, and in zombie flesh eater they just they look like they've been buried for a long time they just they look rotten and rotting um their fingers are all sunken and bony and there's just bits missing off them um i think that's because in the the first two romero it's just kind of started so they haven't had time to, to decompose as much um they do they do a bit more of that in day of the dead they've kind of been rotting for a while but in in the fulci ones you get the feeling they've they've been just hanging around for hundreds of years, most of them. Even, even the recent ones, it's so hot and humid and, and disgusting. They're, they're just, they're falling to bits already and crusty and, and horrible. Even if they don't bite you, you don't want, you don't want them touching you. They're just, they're just, they're horrible. They're really nasty. They do become much of a muchness in terms of their presence. The zombies in Romero's films, you kind of warm to them. I mean, I really felt for all the zombies, and, and, and whereas the zombies in the Italian films, they were kind of just 
they were more like monsters in the classical way. I didn't really warm to them. I couldn't really see the original person, the original human being before the zombie. Zombie flesh eaters is, um, I suppose, not without interest. I'll, uh, I'll go so far as to say that. It's obviously a very stylish film, and you can tell that from the, uh, from the opening scene, which has been much commented on. I saw it uh, when it, it was first released in the cinema on a double bill with the Toolbox Murders, and both films were butchered by the British Board of Film Censors, which uh, annoyed me intensely. I remember that the audience loved zombie flesh eaters, and every time there was an attack by the zombies, they screamed with delight. But of course, every attack had been ripped to shreds by the uh, censors. <laughs> You know what? It was better in widescreen in a cut version than it was on VHS panned and scanned and with all the effects in it uh, because it's a film that sort of depends on its look. I don't think um, those Italian zombie movies, the, 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 the horror boom pictures of the early 80s, were particularly well served by video as a medium because they, they were widescreen. Oddly enough, um, George Romero wasn't shooting in widescreen, so Dawn of the Dead really works on VHS. Um, and you can see why that really took off through the roof uh, during the, the video rental era. Yeah, because uh, it had uh, you know, a smaller frame and the look was slightly grottier, and so it didn't really matter that the image was slightly degraded. But I think those Italian films lost out a lot. And it was only really when they started coming out, uh, actually probably on Laserdisc first, that people realised how good they looked. We were in the midst of the so-called video nasties scare and uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions had decided that um, Zombie Flesh Eaters, along with many other films, uh, was obscene and what developed was an underground movement of aficionados who would pass illegal videotapes from one to the other. It was a very exciting thing to do, of course, because you could, in theory, be prosecuted if you were found with these obscene materials on you. And that was when I first saw the uncut uh, zombie flesh eaters, uh, complete with the scene uh, probably it's most famous for, where the woman has her eyeball skewered on a, a wood splinter. That had been cut completely from the original British release, so that was astonishing. We'd seen a lot of films around that time where they do the build-up and then they cut away and then they show the aftermath. So we were, we were kind of used to that cinematic language where you cut away and show, show the after effects. Um, so we were, we were not expecting <laughs> them to show the entire thing. So it kind of it kind of took us by surprise that we weren't thinking, oh my God, rubber head. So as soon as it appeared, half the people in the audience looked away. The rest of us were watching, going, wow, cool effect. I think there's a moment where it goes from being one of the most upsetting things you've, you're ever going to see in a cinema to, oh, that's rubber. Um, and the sensor cut actually snips out the rubber effect. So you get enough, you get the idea, you get the upsetting bit, but by removing the fakey punchline, it's actually a much more yeah, um, seriously disturbing moment. For me, I mean, I prefer the uncut version to that over the cut version purely because I must admit I'm a, I'm a bit of a sucker for gore. For me, that was like, wow, how did they do that? You know, and it's one of those scenes I got to put my hand up and I think I must have watched it a hundred times frame by frame just to see <laughs> how the effect, that, that special effect was done. Practical special effects, you cannot beat it and the Italians, hats off to them, they, they were the best at it. Because I remember the discussions between him and the director of photography because to be able to have a fire e avere il cambio di, di fuoco sulla scheggia che entrava, avevano bisogno di un obiettivo particolare, perché dovevano passare, adesso non mi ricordo, adesso dico magari una stupidaggio, da un grand'angolo, un certo tipo a un 9. 
e quindi ci voleva un trasfocatore. Io mi ricordo questa cosa, di Luso diceva devi usare un trasfocatore perché altrimenti non ce l'ho a fuoco. Quindi era un grandissimo tecnico, cioè per, riuscire a dare, per cui la scena l'ho ideata io, l'ho descritta minuziosamente, però lui l'ha realizzata perfettamente e io sono quasi sicuro che non sono sicuro che qualche altro regista l'avrebbe fatta così bene come lui. Cioè, penso che solo Lucio poteva farla in quel modo lì. Quindi io ritengo che lui abbia fatto un film, tra l'altro uno dei suoi migliori a mio avviso, eh, perché è angosciante, claustrofobico, eh, tutta la parte ambientata nell'isola dove veramente prende vita poi l'azione. È una sorta di western horror eh, terribile dove appunto i morti risorgono in diretta, ci sono degli effetti speciali bellissimi di Giannetto De Rossi, ci sono degli attori giusti nel loro ruolo, uh, Ian McCulloch, um, uh, Al Cleaver e Tisa Ferro, e Richard Johnson, che è un grande attore che ha lavorato molto nel cinema di genere italiano. Another standout piece in Zombie Flesh Eaters has, has got to be the scene where Aretha Gray is diving. The producers of Piranha 3D think they have cornered the market in underwater uh, topless ballet, but Zombie Flesh Eaters got there way before this with a very long, slightly unnecessary, gratuitous, uh, nearly naked woman swimming around for, for no apparent reason and then all of a sudden a bull shark comes in as well. It's such a clever scene because you, you think the shark is going to get her and that's kind of presented as the threat and there's lots of ominous shots of the shark and you think that's going to be the thing that gets her and then it's a kind of a classic bait and switch, the zombie appears and now there's a zombie and a shark. Allora, la scena dello zombie contro lo squalo nasce perché Ugo Tucci, che era un produttore immaginifico, mi dice io sono stato in Messico, ho conosciuto Cardone, mi sembra che si chiamasse, che è un messicano specializzato in scene di squali. E ho comprato 30 minuti di squali e non so che farci. Quindi vedi te se ti puoi inventare qualche cosa in modo che possa utilizzare questi 20 minuti. La cosa può funzionare soltanto se risvoltiamo, cioè nel senso lo squalo bianco, il temibile squalo bianco, va per mordere e invece cioè, viene morso dallo zombie che è più feroce dello squalo bianco, cioè almeno ci facciamo una risata sopra. It's a very clever uh, writing trick where you have two threats, but then one of the threats is used to combat the other threat. So it's it's a, it's a it's a very nice kind of neat neat way around it. That's got to be one of the best things I've ever seen in a zombie film. A zombie is wrestling a shark, which is amazing. It took Romero how many films to get his zombies underwater? It only it didn't he didn't do it to Land of the Dead. And here already you've got a zombie wrestling a shark. It's a brilliant device just so showing how outrageous it can be and this is not too far off the time of Jaws as well. So sharks are on people's minds so you know the italians are really looking at everything that's happening in american film and saying how can we pull out something for us it's so crazy and so stupid it doesn't really make much sense you know but i love the idea that there's millions of zombies under the sea attacking sharks you know è veramente un pezzo di cinema che uno non si aspetta di vedere non, non so come sia venuta a fulci o agli sceneggiatori questa idea ma è una grandissima idea svolta molto bene è uno dei punti che vedo che del film hanno conquistato tutti Zombie 2 è andato molto bene come è andato benissimo Zombie 1 e invece la produzione minore italiana si è accorta che un film con gli zombie si vendeva abbastanza bene all'estero eh, vendeva denaro facilmente poi soprattutto era facilmente fattibile in quanto bastava prendere 10 comparse coprirle di sangue e via si girava e quindi c'è stata una serie di produzioni però molto minori che in Italia praticamente non hanno avuto nessun successo nessun seguito 
per in quanto erano soprattutto indirizzate per le vendite all'estero, fin fatti con pochissimi soldi, perché il, il trucco degli zombie consente di girare con, pochi, con poca spesa. Dopodiché, dato il successo del, di quella scena lì, poi Lucio ci si è legato sopra, perché è un po' il discorso degli zombie. Cioè, c'era come dire, ripetiamo le cose di successo. Allora, dato che il pubblico vuole lo zombie, dato che il pubblico vuole l'occhio, dato che vuole, diamoglielo. E quindi c'era della ripetitività, che è quella che poi secondo me ha distrutto il nostro cinema. Floodgates opened and as a, the whole slew, you know, uh, with Fulci with the Beyond and City Living Dead, the house by the cemetery. I film successivi di Fulci secondo me sono un tentativo di andare da qualche altra parte, eh, senza abbandonare, diciamo, le caratteristiche degli zombie, il sangue, il mangiare il corpo umano. un vulcano di idee, di, 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 di proposte, di progetti, eh, non si fermava mai, eh, non si accontentava eh, di quello che stava facendo, mentre stava facendo quel film già pensava a un altro film da fare. You can see the progression between Zombie Flesh Eaters, then City of the Living Dead, then The Beyond, then House by the Cemetery. You can see they become more abstract, more peculiar, more pretentious and arty in a, in a way that I sort of respond to. Um, maybe less coherent as narrative and maybe less effective as exploitation. <laughs> I actually believe Fulci had a bit of fun with his with, with his, his his zombie quartet because after the pure zombie movie of zombie flesh eaters, in City Living Dead you had teleporting zombies blink and they're not there, open your eyes and if you fear them that's it, they bite your neck off. There's a whole lot of stuff in in City the Living Dead that is sort of random, isn't there? Uh, it, e even the you know the way the characters are, are regarded as utterly disposable. And then if you go to the beyond, uh, which is, you know, is a masterpiece in its own right, if you actually look at the history of that movie, it was never going to be a zombie movie. It was because the German backers wanted zombies, and zombies were so popular that Fulci was almost forced to write the scenes in at the end of the movie in the hospital when he got Warbeck and Catriona running around to please the German um, audience. So. If that what film wasn't actually co-produced in Germany, what would that movie have been? A, a haunted house picture, maybe? <laughs> the UK marketing on House by the Cemetery, can anyone escape the marauding zombies? Well, we all know there's only one zombie in House by the Cemetery. And he's kind of not your typical zombie, because why would he stay in the cellar? Because if it was me, I'd be coming up the stairs, breaking into the house and eating the whole household, not waiting for them to come down the stairs and find me. Ma quella villa accanto al cimitero si può avvicinare in qualche modo al cinema degli zombie, in quanto il protagonista, il dottor Freudstein, che tra l'altro unisce in maniera ironica due figure chiave, due figure importanti, anche se differenti fra di loro, come il mostro di Frankenstein o il dottor Frankenstein e Freud, ovviamente, unendolo insieme perché Fulci detestava la psicanalisi e quindi ha voluto fare un ennesimo sberleffo, cosa che ha fatto anche altre volte nei suoi thriller, nei suoi film, appunto alla, alla psicanalisi. Comunque, Freudstein in realtà è un morto vivente, ma allo stesso tempo è una creatura ormai sovrannaturale, perché chi è? Eh, ha una voce quasi da, da bambino, eh, però ha un corpo eh, repellente composto da, da pezzi, eh, praticamente una specie di mosaico umano 
con pezzi di, di, di cadaveri che lui ovviamente eh, strappa alle, alle proprie vittime. Non è un film di zombie, nel senso più puro del termine, perché in quel periodo eh, Fulcher aveva già realizzato Paura nella città dei morti viventi e L'aldilà, che sono invece altri, altri film di zombie più, 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 più lineari, più, sicuramente più definiti all'interno del loro genere. Che Zombie 2 invece è un film, infatti, che è quello che è rimasto di tutti quelli, è rimasto quello che è il primo del, del suo tipo ed è, ed è il migliore secondo me. Gli altri sono, alcuni sono belli, molto belli, però sono sempre secondo me incompleti, gli manca molto qualcosa, forse gli manca un'idea chiara su quello che volevano fare oppure non gliel'hanno lasciato fare del tutto, i produttori intervengono spesso in queste produzioni e l'hanno magari costretta a cambiare delle cose e il risultato secondo me non è perfetto come Zombie 2 che è un ottimo film, ancora oggi bellissimo da vedere. Certamente quando io sono stato omaggiato per il Cannibal Holocaust sono stato invitato in tutti i festival, praticamente sono andato alle convention e sono entrato in un mondo che non mi apparteneva, un mondo che io non conoscevo perché non sono mai stato un seguace di film di zombie o film horror, proprio assolutamente no. E quindi ho cominciato però a vederli, sono stato costretto all'inizio a vederli e ho capito la bravura di uno e dell'altro regista. Per esempio i film di Fulci li ho trovati straordinariamente migliori di tanti, di tanti film di zombie fatti da, da, da altri registi che sono inqualificabili. Di Fulci mi piace tutto, Di Fulci, eh, a parte che è un grande amico, è un regista che dove metteva le mani tirava fuori qualcosa di buono, anche nel comico, anche nel... insomma è uno che ha scritto dei, 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 dei film che sono nella storia del cinema italiano, per cui Di Fulci che non posso dire niente di male, proprio eh, lo amo. Lo... E, e, e sono andato anche a vedere i suoi film, i film di di zombie, perché c'è perché un'altra mano, è un, è un fatto di eleganza, è un fatto di girarla con il mestiere vero, con l'eleganza, quella è la cosa importante, non, non essere sciatto mai, essere sempre, seguire sempre la rotta del film, anche con poco budget, ma di farlo bene. Chiaramente dopo Zombie 2, che ha avuto un notevole successo in Italia e anche all'estero, e come dicevo prima, i distributori e i produttori italiani continuano su questa uh, falsa riga, uh, uh, questa, su questa scia lanciata appunto da Fulci. Questa è la stessa cosa che è successo a me, cioè a me quelli che mi hanno seguito in Cannibal Holocaust ho visto qualcuno che, non ha, usa che ha usato il tipo di, di girato eh, alla Cannibal Holocaust e mi è piaciuto, quando poi invece hanno usato dei mezzi per fare porno Cannibal, zombie Cannibal eh, e tutto il resto insomma, non, non, non mi è mai piaciuto e eh, hanno realizzato questi film che poi sono diventati un incrocio tra il genere zombie, il genere cannibali, anche il genere cannibali in Italia non è mai andato bene, non ha mai ottenuto risultati al box office, però all'estero si vendeva molto bene, c'erano molte vendite, anche quello non costava molto perché si andava in un posto selvaggio, si prendevano alcuni indigeni locali, comparse locali e si faceva il film e realizza una serie di film horror eh, uno dopo l'altro. Eh, Zombie Holocaust, per esempio, eh, girato da eh, Marino Girolami. È uno zombie eh, molto atipico, molto anomalo, molto strano, a mio avviso molto divertente, perché unisce in realtà il tema del Mad Doctor, quello dei cannibali, che a quel tempo erano molto, molto in voga in, It in Italia e in generale nel cinema di genere internazionale e appunto il tema degli zombie che erano arrivati grosso modo in, questi, in quegli stessi anni. 
Quindi unendo tre, uh, tre mh, eh, situazioni filmiche, tre plot narrativi differenti, come appunto il Mad Doctor che crea dei mostri terribili, crea i cannibali lui stesso uh, e, e gli zombie, mettendoli l'uno contro l'altro, quindi è anche molto divertente, ha dei de toni di, di, di humor macabro, ironici. Just zombies wasn't enough. So you have things like Zombie Holocaust, which is a zombie movie and a cannibal movie and a mad science movie. Uh, you know, a, 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 the, it's bluntest as Erotic Nights of the Living Dead, which is you know, a zombie movie and a porno movie. E quindi Joy D'Amato, da parte sua, invece, fa, uh, unisce a modo suo altri due, altri due elementi eh, appunto filmici di quel periodo, di due eh, diciamo sottogeneri in qualche modo, ossia l'eros esotico e, eh, e gli zombie, girando appunto le notti erotiche, dei morti viventi. Ecco, e questo è un film anche lì molto ancorato, molto legato a quelle che sono le tradizioni del voodoo, c'è cioè la magia nera, eh, c'è cioè questa figura mh, di questa donna misteriosa che è Laura Gemser, che praticamente fa appunto fuoriuscire i morti viventi anche lei da, dalle loro tombe praticamente. It's basically a pornography film. The zombies have very little to do with it, but it's the strangest pornography film you'd ever seen. Like if, if a person just wants to watch porn, they should not watch this film because it's incredibly disturbing. It starts off at a psychiatric hospital where you think two inmates have just, you know, gotten together to go at it. Then you go back into the past and it's all a porn film. This man wants to buy this island to set up as some sort of brothel and you see him, you know, it's got everything a porn film wants in explicit shots of sex, three ways, girl on girl on this island. And then all of a sudden there's this other woman who turns out to be a ghost and everybody but two of them get killed by the zombies. The last 20 minutes, it's all the zombies. The porn goes completely out the window until the end and the two people who survive go insane and start fucking on the beach. And then they do it again later and they're the two people we see in the psychiatric hospital. It's extremely bizarre. Like, I don't know if they were trying to market it to zombie horror fans who might want to have a little bit of porn in with their movie as well. It's very, it's a very strange take on that. Let's throw some zombies into a porn film and try to get two markets at once. But people who are into porn but not into horror movies would not like this film. A Cannibal Apocalypse. That's an infection movie and it works kind of like a zombie picture and it has zombie elements in it. Uh, but it's also a Vietnam veteran crazy psychopath movie. Oh my gosh, sir, put it down. It's the only cannibal movie I've ever seen where the virus of being a cannibal is transferred through the the action of biting someone. And I guess that, you know, Antonio Margheriti really kind of flipped the genre there. Sometimes by the time the movie comes out, the, the genre lineage becomes so scrambled that interesting things can happen in the inst interstices. Uh, and so that was why it was sort of fun at the time to, to catch up on these, these movies. <laughs> God help us all. I'm a big fan of uh, Nightmare City, um, and I think that brought something sort of new to the genre. There you got zombies at the airport running around with axes, machetes, and all the rest of it. And the zombies run out, and they have guns, and they begin attacking. They, they are a coordinated force. So it's not just that the zombies are running, but they obviously have some, some level of intelligence. So again, it's like, are they truly zombies? Well, it doesn't really matter because all we know is that they're attacking everyone and everybody's going to die. And they go into a television studio where this dance show or aerobics show is going on and somehow they manage to get all the way into this building and attack. That, of course, is reminiscent of Dawn of the Dead, the original film which starts off in a movie studio where we're scientists trying to tell everybody we have to prepare and everybody's ignoring. So, you know, it's sort of a something to that. It's saying, yes, it's invading our media. 
you look back at it after all these years, it actually does, you know, it's one of the more sort of favorite and fun zombie movies to, to watch. Many have been seriously injured and hundreds of lives have been lost. With the end still... Nightmare City, I think, was the first film with the zombies that run. And so obviously 28 days later, you know, like 28 weeks later, they picked up on that. And now it's kind of like most zombies you see now are, are running zombies, you know, so I, I obviously just love the walking ones. In a way, I find the walking ones more scary. Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure why zombies do run, you know, because most people in the world can't run that fast. So I don't understand why you turn into a zombie and you just can suddenly run really fast. I think maybe if you're a marathon runner, a zombie maybe. <laughs> What's interesting about the Romero films is that the zombies are pretty much always the same, put in a different context as Romero explores different social and political situations. What the Italian zombie films do is they change the zombie. Like you first, you have just the regular zombie that we all know, slow moving, trying to eat your brains. But then with each subsequent film, you know, there's teleportation, then they have guns, they learn how to use weapons, they change the zombie, they change the monster. I think obviously once you get into the, the 80s boom when there were so many of these things crowding together in such a brief time uh, a certain numbing rote repetition sets in. You need to hit their head! I told you! See? Like this! Get away! I'm not a big fan of zombie creeping flesh and to me that was kind of a rehash of, 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 you know, of all the other zombie films and Perhaps it was getting a bit stale, a bit bored, and maybe people realised that. No! No! Another one that jumps to the forefront of my mind is Burial Ground, um, with a rather weird Peter Bark playing a, a young kid, but I think in real life he was in his 30s. My God! Yeah! casting a man who I assume is just extremely small in stature as a boy. But then I suppose that had to do with the incestuous content of the film and that's that sort of misogyny, the child returning to the mother's breast and literally devouring the mother. It was mainly shot around one location. Let's get a few sort of people off the street in to be, you know, the main actors and actresses. And it had some, but you know, it's only saving grace really was it had some you know, it had some half-decent effects by Gino De Rossi. And of course, going forward, uh, Romero did Day of the Dead, which for me is, I, I personally feel it's the best zombie movie of all time. Uh, just Savini's work, basically, on the special effects, uh, I don't think it has ever been beaten. It's just grimy and nihilistic. <laughs> Apparently he was in the military. Re return a salute and see what he does. You want me to salute that pile of walking pus? Salute my ass. And then really the um, the whole boom really fizzled out. Uh, and then unfortunately Fulci uh, and Bruno Mattai cobbled together <laughs> zombie free. <laughs> Zombie 3 è un film o sicuramente un po' a sé stante nella filmografia, nella filmografia di Fulci perché, perché in realtà non l'ha finito lui, ossia è un film di Fulci sicuramente perché gran parte delle riprese sono state effettuate da lui eh, nelle Filippine, è un horror ambientato nelle Filippine, in quel periodo si facevano molti film nelle, nelle Filippine, soprattutto Vietnam movie ispirati ai successi americani come Rambo, Platoon, Apocalypse Now, eccetera. Quindi lì ci andarono molti registi italiani come Antonio Margheriti e Bruno Mattei, per esempio. Il produttore eh, del, del, del film decide quindi di affidare delle sequenze aggiuntive perché a suo avviso appunto il film non, non, non raggiungeva un minutaggio completo, uh, a uh, Bruno Mattei e a Claudio Fragasso, eh, che appunto tornano alle Filippine per girare delle scene. Sono le scene eh, del laboratorio, con gli uomini, con i camici bianchi, eh, le scene di, molto sparatorie ci sono, eh, parte delle scene finali anche. Insomma, ci sono delle cose sicuramente più 
quindi non è facile ascrivere completamente Zombie 3 a Fulci, però indubbiamente ci sono degli elementi molto forti, molto violenti, riconoscibilissimi, eh, la testa che esce fuori dal frigorifero e azzanna la gola di una vittima, ci sono, ci sono delle l'impronta del maestro si sente senz'altro comunque. Return of the Living Dead, which was 85, and Zombie Free in 88, they both show the cause of, you know, the world being overrun by zombies, caused by a chemical ash spillage. Return of the Living Dead was, was a big box office hit. So the Italians on their sort of tired and sort of almost waning sort of zombie movies obviously picked up on this and thought, okay, let's chuck the chemical radioactive ash spillage into our own sort of pot of madness and they came out with, with you know with, with zombie free which has got dive bombing seagulls flying heads um it's just it's quite a bizarre movie in the whole sort of canon of zombie movies then followed zombie 4 and zombie 5 uh, but the weird thing is i've never really got my head around is zombie 5 was actually made before zombie 4 So go figure, it's all to do with the titan, the titles and cashing in still on Zombie Due from 1979. I think at that point it, it just it just had run its course. But then most films do, even though zombie films are being made today, it's only maybe every 10 years you get one that's actually any good. Look, sir, look. See, it, it wants me. I think today especially, you know, we've, we've invested so much of the early Romero's, not as more recent ones, which unfortunately have, they've really gone down in quality, but as early ones, we've invested them with so much political and social undertone, where the Italian ones, they're just fun. They're just fun B-movies, but they're really well shot. They're really cleverly staged. And because they are much more grotesque, much more violent, a lot more blood, and, and in cases of some of them, a lot more sex which is sex is not a factor in the Romero, any of the, you know, North American zombie films, whereas they are in the Italian films. You know, we don't take them any sort of serious political or social way that we do with Romero films. To us, they're just fun, fun horror movies. They are a little clump of, of movies Uh, that exist on their own but that's how Italian exploitation cinema seemed to work you know one year everybody would make tough crime films the next year everybody would make cannibal films then they'd make you know Nazi sexploitation films then there'd be zombie films then they went on to something else I think it was Mad Max movies came after or was it Conan imitations but anyway there's these sort of tent poles and everybody Yeah, uh, all the people we now think of as you know, Italian exploitation authors would go and make one of these pictures, or one or two. <laughs> There wasn't that much attention being paid to them when they came out. Um, I mean, in a way, it's a, one of the sad things that, that happened was by the time there was an organized fandom, by the time people were writing about um these films the boom had died there have been a whole bunch of zombie booms you know we've had Shaun of the dead we've had uh the walking dead we've had 28 days later in the door of the dead remake zombie land and yet there are no italian filmmakers out there able to revive the 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 italian boom i mean all subsequent zombie movies i think they look back to these films sometimes you can see uh i mean, one of the things I, I, I find strange is that Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead is as influenced by uh, Italian zombie movies as by Romero's films, uh, partly because one of the things he does is completely strip out any notion of political or social context um, and just kind of gets gruesome and miserable. And I think that yeah, he relates maybe to demons is, is, is the ur text of, of that uh, Yeah, a bunch of awful people get, get gnashed on by monsters. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't think that it was ever going to be something that would last. There's just something about zombies. There's just something wrong and weird about them. And also like vampires, the biggest threat from a zombie, the thing that you don't want to happen is to become one of them. And that's the worst thing. It's not that they'll kill you, Um, 
they will turn you into one of them. And that's, you know, that's more frightening. If you're, if you're trapped in a building and there's a hundred tigers outside, the worst that can happen is they kill you. But if there's zombies outside, even one of them, a tiny bite or a scratch, and you're going to become one of them and you're going to, you'll either become one of them straight away or you'll have this kind of long lingering living death where you know you're going to turn at some point and everyone's kind of watching you with their fingers on their guns ready and you know that they're going to have to kill you and you are you going to have to kill your best friend or your or your wife or your or your dad and and I think I think that's the thing that that keeps them exciting and, and scary and interesting One of the things that happens in the Italian zombie pictures that was later taken up by the um, the rise of zombie video games and then the films based on you know Resident Evil, House of the Dead, that kind of thing, is the idea that zombies become cannon fodder. They become the absolutely perfect modern version of what certain type of matinee western used to use apaches for and what world war ii films use nazis for they look like people but you're allowed to kill them and you don't have to feel bad about it i've kind of uh got tired of zombies i have to say uh zombies have been um in my view overexposed since Romero changed the rules of the game. And although I've tried to keep up with them, um, and I have seen the rest of the Romero films, I have to say, um, they've never had the same impact as that first film. And uh, I suppose it's uh, inevitable. Uh, to me, especially now, it seems as though people are just desperate, desperate to try and alter the formula. But without much success, without that huge impact that Night of the Living Dead had. Forty some years later, people are still making movies about it, about zombies, uh, doing interviews about it, and doing scholarly critiques of zombies. I've kept in touch with the zombie genre and I have to say I'm not really very impressed with what people have been doing. They've been trying to introduce zombies into other environments and uh, it hasn't been entirely successful. I'm talking about films like zombie strippers and zombies of mass destruction. Um, I don't think it's just me. I think these are films that are very unpopular with the fans. They like the idea of the films but when they go and see them they're disappointed and uh, I have to say that anyone coming to zombie flesh eaters for the first time uh, is probably not going to be disappointed. I think it's a film that delivers the goods, I think it's got its problems, I think it's got some pretty ridiculous dialogue and some ludicrous scenes. <laughs> But ultimately, uh, I think it's a satisfying zombie film. It's a stylish one. Lucio Fulci isn't the greatest horror director in the history of cinema, but he's one of the greats. And I think it's very important to see one of his best films as it was meant to be seen, a pristine print, uncut. Mm.